Pennebaker tested the Freudian theory of redemptive catharsis and so catharsis is emotional expression now Freud basically believed, although Freud was sophisticated, that people were damaged often because of terrible things that had happened to them as they developed it's not such a shocking hypothesis, and sometimes people have really terrible things happen to them and he noted that if, you, if people got a chance to talk about these things that sometimes that would make them better now that was a shock to everyone that even a physiological disorder could be cured by talking but if you think it through it makes sense, it's like well, people had problems talking is thinking thinking is problem solving solved problems don't cause trouble, hence cure but that isn't really how Freud construed it, he believed that it was the emotional expression, that the emotions associated with the event had been suppressed or repressed and that the reason people were still carrying them, because they didn't have a chance to fully express the emotion that's the theory of catharsis, and Pennebaker tested that, so he brought people into the lab and he had people write on three consecutive days for twenty minutes about the worst thing that had ever happened to them or I believe the worst thing they had ever done, because that can also traumatize you and then he had a control group just write about like a normal childhood experience to control for writing and then Pennebaker showed that the people who wrote about the traumatic experiences had these beneficial physical and psychological outcomes didn't matter what they wrote? Um, yes, he did a content analysis and so, and this is, he's a very sophisticated researcher, James Pennebaker I interviewed him on my YouTube channel he wanted to find out what predicted what produced health and he had two competing hypotheses, really one was the emotional catharsis hypothesis and the other was more of a cognitive restructuring hypothesis and so, he analyzed words that were associated with emotion like sadness and anxiety and frustration and disappointment he coded all these emotion words and also words that coded for deeper understanding, enlightenment, insight um, and that sort of thing, and then what he found was that the more people used words indicating cognitive insight, the better they got right. which indicated that it wasn't the catharsis, it wasn't the emotional expression that was the key issue, it was the reconfiguration of the memories so that they were more, so that the new representation was more adaptively appropriate what makes it a new representation though? you know, what if, what if you're, uh, something happened and you're very angry about it and all you want to talk about is how angry you are for like ten pages how is well, that that's helpful? A, well, how is that helpful? It, it's hard to say how that might be helpful because maybe that you're angry about something that happened when you were four right well, could you think it through when or you were four? or from four till you were fifteen well, could be well, hopefully you're more verbally astute and you have more analytic and practical tools at your disposal now so when you revisit that, you can bring to bear on the situation all those new faculties that you have as, a, as an adult like, you may still be thinking about this, it's highly probable this is Freudian fixation let's say something terrible happened to you when you were eleven and you really didn't get past it mm -hmm. well, you still have an eleven year old's representation of that, but you're like thirty, so maybe your dad was mean to you but now you know that he had a history of depression and that he was uh, beat up badly at the hands of his father and, but you didn't know that when you were eleven, and even if you did, how helpful would that be? but now you're thirty and you're looking back and you think well, my dad was hard on me, you know, and, but it was worse when he was feeling bad and that wasn't necessarily his fault and also he had a terrible relationship with his dad and, and here's the good things he did and the things he helped me with and beside that, he, we've repaired our relationship in the interim maybe you have or maybe you haven't and I'm no longer susceptible to that kind of bullying in any case right, so and that sounds to me like br broadening out the uh, relationship so the relationship was narrow, eleven year old uh, look on this person, yep. and now you're saying, no, no, there's also positive uh, personality attributes that I hadn't taken into yep. consideration, that I didn't, there's history that I didn't know, and so you're making them into a person rather than into an event yeah, or a stereotype in, yeah. well, with my dad, for example, my dad and I clashed a reasonable amount when I was about thirteen till I was about sixteen when I left home we had a very good relationship before that and after and dad was harsh during that period of time, I would say and he was also 
ill in some ways that made him less patient than he might be. But, by the same token, um, I was somewhat resentful. I didn't take advantage of all the things in the small town that, that I was offered that I could have taken advantage of. I didn't go play tennis or that sort of thing. I could have taken music lessons with a person who offered it to me, and I didn't. And my friends were like quasi-delinquents, and they were not that trustworthy in the house. And so, Dad had his reasons to be um, difficult to get along with at times. I knew that he supported me, and we had had a lovely relationship up to then. So, our fundamental relationship remained intact. But when I look back on that, even by the time I was 18, I knew that whatever trouble I might have encountered with him was at least half due to me, and some of that realization was a consequence of maturation. And as soon as you, as soon as you have a, see, memory isn't a photograph or a movie of something that happened. It's an ongoing interpretation of life. You know, when you when you experience the present, you experience it with a bunch of interpretations and a bunch of assumptions, and you take your best guess. And the past is like that too. And when, and a memory is like that. A memory is, a memory is your assumption about what happened. Mm -hmm. And those assumptions can be erroneous and they can be challenged. And, well, a lot of the therapeutic process is exactly that. Um, and you have to be careful because you can delude people about their, about their memories as well, because they're so malleable. You have to be very careful if you're a therapist not to twist and bend the memories to suit your diagnostic purposes. The reason you're suffering is because you were sexually abused as a child. That's the a priori presumption. Then I'll twist your memories until you come up with, a, with an account that, that suffices to show me that I'm right. Especially for people who are confused, man. You can do that 